Good evening, everyone. We are so thrilled to be here this evening, and um, we thank you very much for joining us for our second round of webinars. With the amazing success from our first round, we thought we would continue to support our diabetes community through these very uncertain times with the very unique webinars that Diabetes Hope Foundation does have. Uh, we are um, a charity that uh, has our alumni speak to the uh, community and we have uh, many wonderful webinars coming up. Um, but this one is a very special one because we have a very special guest and um, I will bring you his name and information in one second. But first, my name is Barbara Pasternak. I'm founder and chair of Diabetes Hope Foundation. And, and I am today. Alex Colley, the program director with Diabetes Hope Foundation. And tonight, Barbara and I will be your wonderful hosts while we lead this amazing webinar tonight. So this evening, before we begin, we would like to thank Abbott Diabetes Care for allowing us to launch our first webinar this season. Um, and we would like to welcome Dr. Michael Vallis, psychologist and registered, registered PhD and registered, registered psychologist, um, along with our esteemed alumni as panelists. So with that, as Barbara mentioned, we are joined by Dr. Vallis tonight and five wonderful alumni from various years of receiving their scholarship, uh, receiving their scholarship. So tonight they will be talking and sharing their insights on diabetes management, as well as their insights and expertise on managing their diabetes on top of having an additional health condition, such as celiac, seizures, learning disorders, nut allergies, ADHD, anxiety, and cystic fibrosis. To address these very complex topics mixed in with having diabetes, um, we would like to welcome, as I mentioned, Dr. Michael Vallis, uh, my Dr. Vallis is a registered health psychologist who's based in Halifax, Canada. He's a health behavior change consultant and associate professor in the family medicine at Dalhousie University. His main area of expertise is adult health psychology with an emphasis on obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular risk, and gastroenteritis as well, if I could say it. <laughs> we can understand it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and how amazing that he recently was awarded the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal by the Government of Canada on the recommendations of Diabetes Canada. What an amazing honor. And we warmly welcome Dr. Vallis. Um, so everyone put their hands together virtually and let's bring in Dr. Vallis. <laughs> Thank you very much, Barb. It's uh, really a pleasure for me to present. As a health psychologist, I'm kind of um, a strange beast because I work in a, in a medical field, um, but I have no medical competency. And so it's often difficult for people to know what actually I do. Um, <clears throat> what I often try to tell them is I try as best I can to sort of represent the voice of people living with diabetes and other chronic conditions. So that's why it's really a privilege to be involved in a discussion like this. Um, my hope is that I can bring some um, maybe some hope to your struggles in both managing conditions and unfortunately also managing the health system so you can get your needs met. Um, one of the things that, that I've, is, is one of my research areas is what we call emerging adulthood. So how do you go from 18 to 30 when you're living with diabetes type 1 as you try to navigate those transitions and how do you get care when there's right now there's very few care services that really are geared to support individuals in that. Um, I'm very much a believer in empowerment and, and see that our job is really to make your job easier. Unfortunately, sometimes it seems like, you know, it looks like, you know, your job is to listen to us and do what we tell you. And I think there's the fundamental tension that I'd like to talk a little bit about. If it's, it's so, okay with you. I've got a few slides that I'd like to present, and, and I won't make this a heavy talk at all, but I just want to sort of provide for people kind of a structure that um, I would encourage you to, to sort of view as a way that you might understand first living with your diabetes, um, but then also in a more general uh, circumstance, how to really promote health and wellness for yourself. So I'm going to try to share my screen and 
with any luck, you can see my screen. And can somebody just confirm, can you see that um, our reference point on the screen? Yep, okay, thanks, Kristen. So um, what I'd like to do is just really make some general comments. Um, first of all, psychological issues associated with diabetes are actually not experienced by all. So one of the really important things that we have to appreciate is individual differences. That's why it's very difficult and why you should never really give advice or if you're living with diabetes, have to be very careful about listening to advice um, because the diabetes has to be completely personalized to the individual's experience. That's why it's really nice to sit on a panel with individuals who have multiple diseases because they truly have to become the experts. And generally these individuals, when they get medical treatment, they actually know more about their condition than anyone else in the room. The other people in the room may be experts in various pieces of the puzzle, but not the whole thing. Um, very few people experience psychological issues with diabetes all the time, but many, many people experience occasional time-limited problems. So it, you can see there's a little bit of an inconsistency there. Sure, you're doing fine, and most of the time you do okay, but actually most people reach times when they struggle, and understanding and supporting those struggles are really important. And because maximizing the outcomes really requires overcoming those challenges. Um, and um, as I'm sure you would know, one of the things that we try to discourage, you see this sometimes in residents where they'll diagnose someone with type 1 diabetes um, or other chronic conditions and they kind of say, look, once you get used to this, it'll be normal, everything will be fine. And whenever we can, we try to jump all over those residents or, or uh, any colleague who says that because you really have to kind of embrace the difference and, and really to, to empower yourself. And I call this surrender to win. And so um, in essence, the challenge that we face is on the screen. And so it's so easy for us on the medical side of things to view diabetes as a biomedical disease. Pathophysiology is extremely well known. We've got all kinds of technologies to help us. And we've got all kinds of apps and, and guidelines. But at the very moment that it's a biomedical disease, it's completely a behavioral challenge. And so those are really two different points. So it's much more important that someone were, would just say to you, what is it that you would like to know? Or how is it that I could help you? Than it is to say, okay, today what we're going to do is review X, Y, or Z. Um, now, diabetes is a distressing disease. And, and as a psychologist, what I love about being in health is that we're not talking about people who have psychopathologies. We're talking about what is burdensome about the disease? And I say that because it's actually important that diabetes providers extend their comfort zone to address the issues associated with diabetes that actually bring burden on. And what do we know? What would make anyone's condition stressful, regardless of what that condition is? Well, how many demands are put on you for care? And the more demands put on you, the more likely you can experience the condition as overwhelming. And type 1 diabetes has, like, the list of behavioral demands just seem to go on and on and on. Maintaining glucose control is enormously complex. Do you ever really know why your sugar level is where it is at any given time? Or does it all seem a little bit like a guesswork to you? They're constant. And it doesn't matter how much you like your job. I know you like vacations. I know you want to retire. When you live with type 1 diabetes, you never get vacations and you never retire. It can be unforgiving. And my first work, I started working with diabetes and type 1 diabetes in particular around 1985. Now, I know that makes me very, very old. Do not try to do the math. Um, and, but what I really, when I first started working, it was with young individuals who were experiencing serious complications at a very early age. And it was a very, very, as you could imagine, difficult scenario. And diabetes is plagued by uncertainty. Uncertainty breeds anxiety. So one of the things that I really would like you to take away is I'd like to normalize the idea of diabetes distress. This is one of the things that we're really trying to push with regard to understanding the lived experience of diabetes. And so we know that the condition is, is 
has burden attached to it and we want to normalize it. So some of the things that we talk about in Diabetes Canada is that at every visit, someone should be asking you about the burden of diabetes, the diabetes distress. Now I say that to you because if they're not, ask them why not? Because when you ask them why not, you will create a teachable moment, especially if you do what I call blame me. So if they say, why are you asking? You can say, I saw this psychologist, Dr. Valls, I think was his name, and he said that we should be asking this question. And if you don't like the question, you can tell him that it's not a good question to ask. And you can always use my email. Um, because in fact, we know that this is really critically important. There are four aspects of diabetes distress that we pay attention to. And I just want to walk you through. And, I, and, and really, this would be something that you could do a check-in with yourself every periodic time that you every visit or, or once a month. Or if you just want to reflect on how are things, you could check in with the emotional burden, regimen distress, provider distress. By the way, this one is my favorite because this is, excuse my language, this is the pain in the ass factor. What I mean by that is how much are we a pain in your ass? Um, and this is what we call provider-based distress. And it's turned out that it's a very important aspect. And it's something that we health providers need to own because we cause it. And so it really falls to us to kind of manage it. Now, I hope you're taking from my language here that these, this is the language that's becoming normal in the professional diabetes centers. So if you feel shy to raise these issues, I just want you to know we already know that we're difficult. I ask my colleagues all the time, do you know that your patients experience you as judgmental? And they respond by saying, yes, we know, and that's why we invited you to this meeting. So it's not a secret to your healthcare providers. And then the final one is, is support distress, when you start to look at your world. And you very well know the people that you can kind of trust and the people you have to be cautious about regarding this. So when it comes to the emotional burden, um, if diabetes were a weight that you carried in a backpack, how heavy would it be? Half a kilogram bag of rice, a two kilogram laptop, 20 kilogram cement block, or a 500 kilogram car? I personally love that question because people answer it very quickly and it's very telling. It's really, really telling. And it varies depending on what's going on in your life. Overwhelmed burnt out and powerlessness. So these should be the questions we're asking you. And these should be the questions if you want, if your partner, your boyfriend, your spouse, your parent said, how can I support you? You can say, well, you could ask me these questions. Are you feeling kind of burnt out by diabetes? Is that, you know, be, rather than saying, come on, you can do it. I know, just hang in there. You might want to just kind of reflect on what the experience is because this is what's really helpful. Um, and it's what we see, emo uh, uh, especially amongst the type 1 individual. The, the typical person with type 1 diabetes is incredibly competent at managing their disease. And I don't know that we give enough credit to that competency. Regimen distress is about the management distress, the day-to-day -day tasks. But importantly, we know it's about eating distress and it's about hypoglycemia distress. I do a lot of my research on the issue of hypoglycemia distress, and we find it to be a tremendously uh, underrated problem by healthcare professionals. Most healthcare professionals tend to only be interested in if you've had a serious hypo. Have you lost consciousness? Were you admitted to hospital? Did you have to call the EMT? Turns out that's the tip of the iceberg. When you look at the psychological impact of loads, it, they have a huge impact. And, and we really do need to support distress management because the most normal response to a serious hypoglycemic episode is to allow your sugars to go high because the safest way of avoiding another low is to be high. And so managing that, we call it compensatory hyperglycemia following a hypoglycemia episode, it's a psychological fear management, not a glucose management problem. Provider distress, I can't tell my diabetes doctor what's really on my mind. My diabetes doctor prov providers don't really understand what it's like. Um, I don't get help be that I need. And my doctor's providers do not know enough about diabetes or diabetes care. I'd be really curious. I'm going to kind of make a little um, plug here for the panel members. Because the panel members, um, I understand, live with multiple conditions. 
So I'd be really interested in what the provider distress is like when maybe you have more than just the diabetes. And sometimes providers are very narrow. You know, I'm a diabetes doctor. All I talk about is diabetes. Well, you've got something that's maybe not diabetes. Therefore, I'm not so interested in that. So I'll, I'll just be curious. Maybe they could comment. And then social support distress. And you can see that what we're doing is just indicating. So if you ever have any of these kinds of features, this is part of a really important concept. And we're hoping that individuals living with the disease can start to communicate this. Because one thing we know about doctors is if the patient raises the issue, the doctor feels responsible to take care of it. If the doctor's not comfortable with the issue, they won't raise it. It's what we call inertia because they don't want to go into an area that they don't feel super confident in. But if you raise it, they kind of have to go with it. Um, and so when it comes to sort of managing this distress, I just like to kind of touch base on thinking, doing, and feeling. And we know that these are different aspects of psychological functioning. And you can be helped by just kind of thinking about what do you do from any of these categories? And so really the thinking component is really to try to maintain a positivity. You know, we know we hear about things like gratefulness. We hear things. Um, if you want to improve your mood, do you want to know a really great way to improve your mood? A random act of kindness is one of the best ways to improve your mood. Um, so looking for, you know, more positive encounters, challenges, um, the doing part, part, keep connected, really try to find partners and learn assertiveness because, um, you're the one that's going to be the expert in how to manage your condition. And unfortunately, the way humans tend to act, interact is if I care about you and I want to help you, I'm going to tell you what to do, which of course is the wrong way to support somebody, especially somebody who's actually pretty good at coping on their own. And then from an emotion point of view is really focusing in on pleasure. Um, I, we know that change is hard and, and, you know, we go through our lives trying to maintain sort of our health, and change is hard because human nature is you approach play, pleasure, you avoid pain. So apple pie tastes a lot better than apple and getting up early to exercise sucks when you can sleep in. Um, we follow the path of least resistance and we focus on immediate consequences. A lot of the health behaviors you're gonna be asked to do cause pain, require a lot of effort and you don't see the benefit for a long time. So we have to recognize that we live in a world where it's actually hard to be health, focus on health, and that it makes it really difficult given the nature. So I'm gonna quickly stop, but I wanna show you how human behavior works. And this is our little brain here. And our brains are what we call developmental organs. So if you just look at the brown, the green, the red, the blue, I kind of, that's a way of representing various areas of the brain. As, the, as we have developed as a species, these brain areas, develop and they develop on top. So the new brain areas kind of sit on top of the old. But what happens in the brain, it's a developmental organ. That means that the old brain structure doesn't stop working. It keeps doing what it's doing and you add on new features. So that means that we have two areas of our brain that control our behavior. We have our wanting system, which is this limbic system, which is a primitive system. That's how you feel. It's immediate. And then we have our frontal lobes, the very last thing to develop, not fully developed in girls until the ages of 23 to 25. And the frontal lobes are not fully developed in boys till the ages of 27 to 29. And that's why you see, you know, young males doing all these crazy things. Um, it takes a little bit of time before they started realizing that driving on the highway late at night with the, after a couple of drinks in the rain with a motorcycle is actually not a safe thing to do. Um, and so this is the nature. And I say this because what we have to do is accept that you're pulled in two directions. One of the things that I worry tremendously about as a psychologist is people who try to change, run into barriers, and then feel like failures and then blame themselves and think, oh, you know, I should just be trying harder. There's something wrong. Why do I keep falling back into this pattern? I know what I should do. I really do want to do it. Why do I fall back? And we do that in a judgmental way. And just as we know that if your healthcare provider judges you, that's not helpful. Self-judgment is also not helpful. 
And so the purpose of this slide is really to show this is us. This is the human condition, this teeter-totter between do you listen to what you know you should do or do you follow what you want to do? And it really is important if we accept that, that we can promote self-compassion. If you can understand your behavior, that'll help you to your next choice. Finding motivation is really about asking yourself, why do you want to change? So it's not about health. Right? The exchange that will happen in the health system is, oh, you know, this will reduce your risk of retinopathy. This will improve your heart function. That's not what drives people. What drives people is the personal meaningful reasons. Are you a family-oriented person? Are you an achievement person? Are you a thrill seeker? You know, what do you want from your life? Who, who are you when you're at your best? And if you can link the diabetes care behaviors and see those as is ways, the price that you pay to live the life that you really want to live, then that's where motivation comes from. Similarly, understanding that there's always barriers to change. And a lot of what, what I end up doing is trying to help people figure out how to overcome those barriers. That's what the, these types of webinars can really do. Listening to other people is a tremendously beneficial way of finding you know, your own personal strategies. And critically important is try to, don't be shy about, about picking favorites. Um, you know, people that are dragging you down, you know, be really careful about how close you get to them. Um, because you know what, you, you, you know, it's hard enough to stay and to keep motivated. And we have to be, sometimes we have to be kind of harsh about, you know, who's truly a friend and who is not. Um, we call them saboteurs. And you know what I'm talking about if you just sort of reflect on that. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing. How do I stop sharing? I can stop sharing here. Okay, so I've stopped sharing. So I just wanted to take a few minutes. I'm hoping that you'd find that helpful. Um, you know, through Barb and, and Alex, I can share my slides with them. So if anybody wants to access those slides I just showed you, then, um, you know, I'll let um, Alex and, and Barb um, arrange for that. So yes, thank you very much, and I'll stop now. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Vallis, for sharing. All the information was incredible that you shared. I'm sure our panelists have some questions burning in their minds. Um, so Barbara, I guess we'll move on and we'll introduce our speakers, and then we'll let them ask their questions. Uh, so Kai, do you want to give a brief introduction about yourself? Hi there, so I'm on Vancouver Island. I'm actually in my, my office. I'm a clinical social worker, which is a boring title for a fun job because I just meet with <laughs> awesome humans all day of all ages and um, diverse backgrounds of the kids older. And um, yeah, so I live with diabetes and ADHD. Very interesting. Thank you, Kai. Kristen. So oh, hi, I'm Kristen. Um, I am currently coming to you from York Region, specifically Vaughan. Um, I live with, so long story short, um, I had 95% of my pancreas removed when I was only three years old um, due to hyperinsulinism, uh, seizures, and as Dr. Vallis mentioned, hypoglycemia. Um, and as part of also developing diabetes, I got uh, such things as not being able to read my symptoms, uh, learning disorder, nut allergy, and a um, reactive anxiety disorder. And I currently work with the York Region District School Board as a child and youth worker, working with kids with special needs, currently working from home. You do so much, Kristen, with so much already to do yourself. Thank you for sharing. And Allie. Hi, um, my name is Allie. Um, I work with the Diabetes Hope Foundation. Um, I've been working with them since 2013 when I received my scholarship. Um, I'm from Ottawa. I'm 25 years old now. I live with cystic fibrosis and cystic fibrosis related diabetes. Um, my educational background is communication studies and psychology as well as a postgrad in brand management. Awesome. So fascinating as well. And Janet. Hi, I'm Janet, also coming to you from Ottawa. Uh, I am a scientific project coordinator for Health Canada. Uh, I've been living with type 1 diabetes for 25 years. So I was diagnosed when I was 18 months old. And I also have been living with celiac disease for the past three and a half years. Wow, that's, that's a lot. <laughs> and uh, finally, Logan. 
Hi, I'm Logan. Um, I've been diabetic for seven years now and I was diagnosed with celiac disease about a week after I got diagnosed with type 1. So that was another learning curve all at the same time. Um, I'm a DHF scholarship recipient this year, so that's really exciting. And I'm going into my first year of nursing school this year. So lots already on the go. So again, thank you to Dr. Vallis for sharing your slides. And yes, please be sure to pass those over to Barbara and I so we can add them as a resource. So panelists, I'm looking at you all. So because Dr. Vallis shared so much interesting information, like I said, I'm sure all of you have some burning questions. So Kai, I'm gonna start with you. Do you have anything that you wanna ask specifically to Dr. Vallis? Well, I was going to say I was taking notes, so I really appreciate this because I am at work and I'm taking a little break, but this is super useful for me, all this information, because I work with a lot of people that are struggling with this. So I love this um, and being a human myself in my work, right, so that we're, we're all humans trying to help each other. So um, to help myself and others, you know, I mean, I was just curious, uh, this is pretty general, but if there's anything that's come up in literature or research or just through practice about um, yeah, the interesting nuances of living with ADHD and managing diabetes. Yeah, so um, one of the, the the really interesting things about about I think where we are now, um, and and it's um, I, I I've been taking to call it the following: when when behavior meets biology, so we're beginning to develop um, a better understanding of um, what's actually underlying uh, from a brain function and structure perspective, um, the behavioral challenges. And so I'm hoping that what that will do is allow us to um, really figure out how to uh, take a bit more of a compassionate approach. And so the reason for that would be, you know, Kai, something like um, ADHD. So when you look at what's going on with ADHD, um, it sort of looks like what's happening is in that sort of um, a frontal lobe executive systems. And so things are, um, you know, the ability to sort of uh, stay focused and, and sort of track um, sort of working memory, which the, and working memory would basically be, okay, you're, you know, you're kind of, uh, uh, you know, you're organizing, you know, your files somebody distracts you and says, oh, can you come here for a minute? You go, and then you say, what was I doing? And, you know, can you actually remember that, you know, 45 seconds ago, you were actually working on your files? Um, that's kind of, you have to hold everything kind of in this working memory. And with ADHD, that shifts a little bit. And the, what, where, where this is going is it's really helping us look at this in terms of then reframing how we help people. Because unfortunately, Kai, the, the relationship between the patient and the provider has always been like this. And sometimes you might have heard this. Doctors will say, I've got lots of patients who are able to do this. So if they can do it, you can do it. And that just completely um, invalidates individual differences and biological variabilities. And so as we start to understand, okay, hang on a second, that's not fair. You can't just ask one. And the way I put it this way is as follows, because this, by the way, is true. It is possible for someone to run a marathon in two hours, one minute, and 34 seconds. That's the world record. But that doesn't mean that everybody should be able to run a marathon in two hours, one minute, and 34 seconds. As a matter of fact, only one person has done it. Um, but we have a tendency to think, well, if it's possible, then it should be possible for you. So one of the things that I'm hoping we'll be able to do is we kind of start to look at um, what are the limits of behavior. So when you have cystic fibrosis, what does that mean? When you have celiac disease, um, and you heard about gastroenterology, that's the sort of GI conditions. And so that's where we would see the celiac patients. So, so um, you know, Janet, to be diagnosed with celiac, I'm sure you've seen a gastroenterologist and probably the doctor who diagnosed the celiac disease. But just imagine, the celiac disease sort of loves food that diabetes hates. It's, it's a nightmare because the foods that make your gut feel okay are, are not necessarily the, good, the, the foods that sort of, you know, do well in terms of blood glucose. And it, sometimes it's kind of the absolute opposite. So it really provides kind of challenges. So for me, it's kind of, it's validating the limits of behavior, which then allows us to say, 
Okay, given the fact, right? So what ends up happening is doctors kind of say, well, if only you got to try harder, right? Because this is the gu- this is the guideline. This is what you need to do, and we want to understand behavior such that we can shift. If only, if only you could do this. To given that you have X, Y, or Z, what is the next plan? And it's that shared um, uh, problem solving. The other new thing that's happening, and I think it's kind of, I'm hoping it's related to COVID. And that is because um, we're starting to understand that COVID is going to have an incredible mental health impact, that many people, are, we're starting to see COVID more as a traumatic stress than just sort of a, a stressful life event. Um, and so that's really putting the, the increasing the, the sensitivity to mental health issues. So I've been invited to do a, a keynote um, a presentation at Diabetes Canada meetings um, in, in, the, in, in the fall um, on diabetes and mental health, just because the, and the group are saying, we got to know more about mental health because we, we expect this. So, so, you know, ironically, this kind of negative pandemic event might actually increase our ability to support the journey. So I hope that was helpful, Kai. Thank you. That was, that was wonderful, Dr. Vallis. I, it just a segue into what you just talked about, COVID mental health. Um, change can be very hard. And, and as most people know, especially those who don't have diabetes, I'm, you know, find it probably more difficult. Um, and we know that, you know, that we have to adapt to our day-to-day and healthcare routines during, due to COVID. Uh, with modern society, and sometimes encourages unhealthy behavior, example, wanting to get fast foods when you have um, a long and stressful day, what are some of the strategies or solutions to help avoid this, um, to pull from unhealthy behaviors? Yeah, so that's a really, really important. Um, and um, so it's, it's my belief because of the work that I do and, and partly because of what we know about biology that I'd like to suggest to everybody that food is a different behavior than any other behavior. And food is a different behavior. Eating is, does, not, does not belong in the same camp as any other behavior. I'd like to say that really clearly. And that is because um, eating food is actually um, uh, 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 the, the, really a biological imperative. And so the brain system has really developed so that you know, food is, um, is, uh, is, is just so powerful. For instance, the following two substances. So I showed you that sort of limbic system in the, in the midbrain and the frontal lobe, the emotional system. Well, that limbic system, that's where our pleasure centers are. And that's where addictions come from. And the following two substances light up the pleasure centers of the brain equally. And those two substances are sugar and cocaine. And when you compare sugar and cocaine head to head, sugar wins. So, and that's because you see the body is meant for survival. So we, we then have this drive to eat. So the two things here is, is first of all, to, to respect that and, and to do two things. One is what is driving your, your, your eating behavior. And, and the reason that I'm making a big deal about food as a, as a special behavior it's just so darn easy for it to be the reinforcement. It's just so easy to grab a chocolate bar, to look forward to a drink, to, it's, you know, food is just the, the, the easy coping strategy. And, and for every one of us. So it, the sort of psychological piece to this would be to say, hang on a second, if you're not happy with what you eat. So I like to say that eating is like a relationship, right? And I actually ask people, um, what is your relationship with food? And so, for instance, you can all diagnose yourself right now. I'm going to ask you a question. You're going to have to, you're going to choose one of two options. Nobody can sit in the fence. So you have to put yourself in one of these two categories. You either eat to live where food is fuel or you live to eat where food is a passion. You can't be on the fence. And now you know where you fit. And so that really tells us that sort of drive. So food is such a powerful phenomenon. What is it that would 
your relationship with food be? And, and here's, a, here's a good relationship. Have you ever been in a relationship where you loved something, you loved somebody, and it didn't, she or he didn't love you back? Think about that. That doesn't work. Right? So if you're eating foods and feeling bad about afterwards, that's like being in a bad relationship. You think you love the food, but if it loved you, you would be happy when you ate it. So this gets into all these emotional issues. And if we just kind of reflect and say, you know, food is a natural, it's a trap. It's a sand trap. You can fall into it. We all fall into it all the time. Right. And I'd say to you, I don't care what your attitudes towards Twinkies is, but if you had two Twinkies a day for 28 days, you would want Twinkies because you have a brain. So we sort of want to, and I call this replacing the function. So I've got myself in a pattern where I'm turning to food to manage my stress and I'm not really happy with this. I'm not happy from a diabetes point of view. I'm not happy from a health point of view, but I've fallen into the trap. So what is an alternative function? So if you're managing stress, what are other stress management activities? And the other thing I would strongly encourage you to do is, is let's, let's eat fast food. But you know what? A bag of carrots is fast food. Fast food does not mean junk food. Fast food means, means quick food. And talk to, a dietitian is a wealth of knowledge. You could spend five minutes talking to a dietitian and ask the question, I would like to access some fast food that would be healthy for me. Can you give me three or four things that I could do? And all you need is a couple of those. So when, when it comes to fast food, because remember, if all you're trying to do is fuel, fast food means we don't have time, we've got to eat. So we might as well eat good fuel because then that'll keep our engines functioning well. We're not really, it's not a meal. It's not your, you're not going out to, um, you're not going out to a, a, a you know, a, a graduation meal. You're not going to a family event meal where you want to enjoy, you want to be like an Italian and take six hours to eat the 12 courses, right? If, if you're going for one of those events, then you want to enjoy your food. But if you're saying, look, I just have to eat, then you might as well just kind of grab something quick and that meets the needs. Um, so that's how I would respond to that. That's a great answer, Dr. Vallis. Thank you. And it seems across the board that uh, everybody's received your message very well and have to agree with uh, carrots being fast food. I can just grab a bag and it's fast, it's food. So on the food topic, um, Janet, I'm going to jump over to you because I know that you had a question for Dr. Vallis. It might not be about food, but I know that you have celiac, so kind of made me think of you. So the floor is yours. Let me unmute myself first. <laughs> uh, so as I mentioned, like I've been diabetic for, since very young age. So there's a lot of burden put on children, especially growing up gaining that independence from that transition from parent taking management to now taking care of yourself. And then you add on that extra task of you're swapping to adult care, where quite often the endocrinologists or your team, they're used to seeing type two diabetics, or maybe they have some type ones, not as many that have been diagnosed for so long. How do you bring up the discussions of distress that and the burden that has been wearing down on the shoulders for 25 years. Yeah, yeah, that's a really, really great question. Um, I'll make a, a same a comment, I, and it may sound a little strange to you, um, but I'll explain it. So, do you know that um, the 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 group of people who tend to get really poor health care are nurses? Do you know that nurses get really poor health care? Now, the question is, why do nurses get really poor health care? Because everybody assumes they know everything and they don't need any support. And so that's the connection back to you. That, oh, you've had diabetes. Oh, well, then, you, you know, you're fine. And so it's really about two things. One is that we need a community to try to shift the conversation. People like me are really trying to, to do that. So I'm actually working... Um, on an, a beginning of an initiative with JDRF, where we're going to try to provide a training program for mental health providers in, in Canada and, and we train them in, in, in what they need to know about diabetes so they can stretch into the diabetes field and maybe start you know, promoting, asking more questions. Um, I would um, sort of encourage you to, to you know, um, uh, pick your battle, pick your time when you feel most uh, strong 
and then prepare a statement and say, I'm really nervous, doc, but there's something I need to say to you and I'm just gonna read it to you. And it might sound like, why haven't you asked me about how diabetes affects my health, my mental health? Um, and uh, again, blame me. Um, go on and find information from, from, from any health professional who's, who's talking about this is important and kind of bring it in. So I have a, I wrote a paper if you, it's actually the, the paper that I'm most proud of. Um, I've published quite a few papers over the years, but that doesn't mean anything. But the paper I'm most proud of is, is a, a treatment for fear of hypoglycemia. And, and it's called, you know, hypoglycemia, fear of hypoglycemia is more of a fear problem than a glycemia problem. We published it with a group of people. I have a few colleagues in, in, in Europe. And it's the paper I'm most proud of for the following reason. I've given it to patients and they've given it to their doctors. So, so the patients have liked the paper and then they've taken it into their doctors. And then they came back and said to me, this was really helpful because when I gave it to the doc, the doctor actually read it and found it kind of helpful. So it's making that, that kind of shift. Um, I'd also like to make you aware um, I have a colleague, her name is Dr. Molly Byrne, um, and she is uh, equivalent to me as a sort of diabetes psychologist. She's, she's from the University of Galway in, in Ireland. And Molly has led a program called um, uh, Type 1 Now. And it's a, it's a, um, it's a per participatory program about empowering young individuals with type one diabetes, trying to navigate this very system that you've described. And she has, there's lots of great stories and lots of great stuff. So again, I can make that available. I'll let uh, Alex know the link to, to Molly's work, but it, people on the, uh, on the call, you know, if you wanna kind of poke around, that project would be um, kind of useful because it's very much about um, um, you know, really trying to empower the group to, um, to not feel that, that they're kind of, um, you know, it's almost like in the health system and, you know, we feel like um, the, the adult healthcare system makes people feel like we're not interested in you. Um, and so, you know, ways of shifting that I think can be really, really important. Did that address your question? Yes, it did. Thanks so much. <laughs> Dr. Vallis, we would love to get that information uh, on Dr. Molly Bird. More information, more resources about this will help so many try to navigate their journey, of course. Um, I just want to ask Ali, because I, I don't know if you have a specific question, but you have a very interesting background. <laughs> Um, CF and um, CF diabetes. I, I don't know what that means, but perhaps you can speak to Dr. Vallis in the audience about your question. Sure, yeah. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say, Dr. Vallis, thank you so much for every piece of information, everything you've said so far. It's so validating. And there is a, as a patient, I feel such a huge gap between, um, you know, your mental wellness and your your physical conditions and uh, you're really bringing it together and uh, it's incredible um, thank you uh, and my question so I do have cystic fibrosis and CF related diabetes um, cystic fibrosis for those who don't know is a lung disorder um, the only re I was born with cystic fibrosis and I was diagnosed with diabetes when I was 14 and the only reason I got was diagnosed with diabetes was because of the cystic fibrosis um, and um, growing up I had a endocrinologist uh, on one side and a CF team on the other and it wasn't until I was 18 and transitioned to um, an adult clinic that I had this new CF related diabetes team. Um, so my, my understanding is that it's still fairly uncommon um, and I'm just wondering if you've ever really come across it before um, or how you help, you know, patients who deal with such conflicting physical um, disabilities? Yeah, yeah um, thank you. That's a really important question. And I think um, my comment is that we actually don't do a really good job. We, we really kind of fail people in that situation, to be honest. Um, and I think that um, so what I would say to you, though, because the system doesn't seem to naturally want to put pieces together, you know, mm. it, you know, so, so why is the Mayo Clinic so, so, so famous? 
right? Everybody in the world knows about the Mayo Clinic. Do they have better doctors than, than at your local hospital or at my hospital? Because they actually don't. So why is the Mayo Clinic such a famous clinic? And I'll tell you why. If you went to the Mayo Clinic, here's what would happen. You'd be seen in the morning. It would be determined all the doctors in, that you would need to be seen. You'd see those doctors one after the other in the morning. Then in the afternoon, you would have all the tests that you would need. Then tomorrow morning, all of the doctors would get in a room together with all of the tests, and they would invite you in. And as a team, you guys would figure it out. That's why the Mayo Clinic is famous. So I say that to you because what I try to do when I have, um, when I'm involved with individuals like yourself, is try to create a team. So I try to, I would, I would suggest to you, well, who's the point person? So who's the person on your team who you feel, and listen to the response, well, listen to this, who you feel most close to and who has the most power? When you get into the medical system, we all know it is a power-based system. And so you got to have somebody on your side who has sort of more power. So, so it's usually a physician. But, you know, you find sort of a pivot person and then you work with that person to say, how do you bring everybody together? Because if you have a, a medical support person, then and you you can work with that person and team up. And it's like your job is to get everybody in a room at the same time. And I have to tell you, that is incredibly difficult. I find that uh, we work literally, Ali, months to get a full team meeting, but do not give up. The strongest predictor of success is not giving up. And so it, I would just say, if you had a person who, and because nobody's gonna disagree with you. You see, nobody's gonna you know, write on a chart, there's no way this patient deserves to have integrated care. Oh, there's no way that Dr. X has to talk to Dr. Y. That, that's completely against any um, approach to clinical management, we all would would do that. And so it's just not giving up. And so what happens, we often have, you know, one doc cancels for one meeting, somebody else can't make the next meeting. But after three or four tries, it happens. And it's worth it. Because then for one patient yourself, right, it'd be great when you have this kind of combined clinic, it's awesome. Um, but if you don't have the clinic, if you have this sort of uh, ability to create your own team meeting, we only find that you have to don't you don't have to do that very often before now all of a sudden things are kind of integrated um, and uh, and that can be really helpful especially because in the team um, it'll be a little bit easier for your voice to be heard you know because there's all these multiple perspectives so no one you know if there's a respirologist and an endocrinologist and a family doctor and your voice nobody's going to dominate that because the family doctor is not going to let the endocrinologist document, uh, do, you know, dominate it. So, so you kind of can, can, can use that. So that's what I would suggest to people who are in this situation um, where they could advocate um, for a, a team meeting. They're very helpful. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome answer, Dr. Ballas. Thank you for sharing. It's so interesting hearing about the power differences and creating a team. So with that question, or with that question answered, sorry, I'm gonna to move to Logan, because I know that he had a question surrounding kind of his personal team. So uh, Logan, I'll pass it off to you. Um, thank you for everything so far, Dr. Ballas. Um, it's been um, some very valuable information you've had for us tonight. Um, so I just was curious in regards to um, how you were mentioning burnout and that sort of thing. Um, how would you go about, um, I guess, uh, talking to a family member or someone in your family um, to check in on you in regards to burnout and that sort of thing? Because I think sometimes uh, having diabetes for a long time, people think that you are, you know, self-sufficient and that you don't really need to be checked on and that sort yeah. of thing. So I was yeah. just curious on your thought about that. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So I have two comments for there for that. One is um, is it's it's very useful to um, I guess the simple thing for us to do is is learn rules. 
you know, when I go to this friend's house, I have to take off my shoes because everybody takes off their shoes. But when I go to this friend's house, nobody cares. So I can't leave my shoes on. So whenever I go to this place, I always have them on. Whenever I go to this place, I always have them off. That's kind of just the easy way it is. You learn a pattern, you do it. So that's, that's how people would approach support. You know, what do I do to support you, Logan? And so, and then they want to do that same thing all of the time. So if you could kind of communicate that the person living with diabetes needs to be in charge of what they need. And so, so if you could kind of say, um, so here's what I would do is, is, is I often, when I'm, when I'm seeing a patient, uh, communication is really important to me. Um, there's a lot to say. Um, and so I'll say to somebody, you know, if, if you're struggling with something that I'm saying, if something isn't quite sitting right, or you're not quite sure, you don't know, you're not, maybe you don't have a response because a lot of people say, well, I'm not quite sure what to say. I would just say, just let me know that things aren't okay. And you could do that just by putting your finger up or just putting your hand up or just by making a call. We make kind of, it's almost like an agreed upon signal. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you could sort of, um, you know, kind of communicate that, like, you know, would, would they allow you to sort of cue them as to when you might need some support? Um, mm -hmm. The other comment I would make to you, and it's really quite important, and it, I think it's most important in diabetes, um, and, and I'll illustrate that with a really quick example. The following kind of question could is a very dangerous question if you're trying to support someone living with diabetes. And that question is, should you be eating that? Because that is a question where you might get two extreme responses. One is, whew, thank you. I was about to step into that, and I'm really glad that you caught me. Thanks very much. And the second is, shut up and get out of my face. And the problem with the person who's asking the question is they don't know which response they're going to get, because it really depends on whether you've decided that this is perfectly appropriate and it fits into your meal plan and you're really looking forward to this, in which case that question is irritating, or if you're in a situation where you're struggling yourself and you just need that little bit of support. So it's a concept we call autonomy support, which is if you could educate the loved ones in your life, the way they can support you is they say, what is it that I can do to help you now? I really wanna support you, Logan, what can I do so you're illustrating support, you're expressing your concern for the person, but it doesn't come with a, I heard about this herb from central Brazil, it's going to cure your diabetes, you can get it on the internet for $12.99. Um, you know, those kind of comments, which you already know about, um, but it's more um, what we call autonomy support. So, so letting the person know you want to support them, but then giving them the power to let you know what to do. So I hope that can help. Yeah, that does help. Thank you. Okay, this has been exceptional for so many. Um, and I, I just, I want to ask Kirsten, I think she's the last one, if you have anything to add before we wrap up, unfortunately, time has gone so quickly. Yeah, no, I mean, wow really enjoyed this listening to everything you touched on and stuff like that and especially with the hypoglycemia being somebody who's lived with that since the age of three to being diagnosed with that and you know having it cause the fact that I can't even read my own symptoms which is a complication that back then you know wasn't common but nowadays more people with diabetes are experiencing that inability to read their symptoms so I guess what advice do you have for people like that and then also what can the general public need to know about being around somebody with a person who's hypoglycemic or have hypoglycemic tendencies yeah yeah no it, it's actually you know really good so it's called hypoglycemia unawareness it's a, a recognized aspect of diabetes um, and um, and it's a it's really really challenging I mean certainly it's it's where the, um, the, the technology is, can be really, really helpful, especially the smart meters that kind of can, can detect trends, right? Because then 
they can be really, really helpful. And, and I don't know, um, you know, if you know any loopers, you know, these are people that kind of figure out how to get their pumps to talk to their uh, continuous glucose uh, sensing systems. And they're working on sort of, I'm actually involved in a project in, uh, out of McGill on the artificial pancreas, and it looks really, really promising. Um, and, and so, you know, it looks like this kind of thing will be, and, it, and for you, it would be incredibly helpful. To, to recognize that. So it's really the sort of the, the monitoring. The one thing we would encourage you to do really is just, is just uh, you'd, be, you'd be really, um, really a, a ideal candidate for flash monitoring or for, 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 for continuous glucose monitoring because you can just kind of, you know, every time you feel strange, you can just you know, kind of find out where you are and it kind of gives you that kind of um, issue. I think the other thing is to be really careful to, to, to educate your, your, your loved ones, the, the people in your family um, you know, the people super close to you, if you're comfortable with this, you, obviously it's something that you have to be comfortable with, but, you know, maybe um, with, if they are, um, are comfortable testing you, if need be, so that, um, you know, if there was any, any ever sort of doubt. Um, and, and the other thing is, I like to try to, you know, send this message as, as broadly as possible, um, which is, if you see a person and they appear to be drunk, and it's not like 12 o'clock at night at the local pub. Um, you know, it's, it's a, a sort of in an odd situation. There's a very good chance that they're having a hypoglycemic episode. Um, slurring of speech, uh, slightly disheveled appearance, a little unsteady gait, maybe a bit sort of kind of cognitively stunned a little bit. And so, you know, the people that you're really, really close to, if you felt you could be comfortable sharing any of those symptoms, because then maybe it's kind of like, uh, and then, you know, if you had the agreement with people, um, you know, uh, uh, in which it would be like, you know, Kristen, are you, are you low? You know, if that was sort of an acceptable question to you, and then any of your friends, you know, it was kind of okay for any of your friends to say, you know, Kristen, are you low? Um, now that goes a little bit against what I just said about the irritation piece, but given your particular situation where you're so vulnerable to this, this could become sort of something that you and people in your world um, would uh, convince. And the only other thing is that I don't know why in media do they still give insulin when somebody has a low on TV? Like, I mean, like, why do they do that? That just does not help the general public when it comes to any kind of, of, I have no idea why, even for like years and years, they, they sort of give them insulin. It's like, yeah, kill them. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, I can't ever really understand that one. So I, I know that's probably not super helpful to you because of the nature of the, the situation, but I hope those, those comments have been used. I, I remember when my kids were rushed to the hospital uh, in sports accidents, of my, you know, my two younger kids, and they had most emergency docs and nurses have no idea how to treat kids with diabetes. And they would say, give them insulin. I said, are you kidding? They're already low. Well, what do you mean they're low? They need, I said, they need orange juice. They don't need insulin. So I think the education has to come within the medical system sometimes, uh, which is really sad. But um, obviously you are, a, 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 a wonderful gem and you've been amazing and we have been so grateful and thankful to have you here and I know that these panelists um, are truly appreciative of the information as well as all those other wonderful guests that we have in virtual land who we can't see faces uh, so we want to thank you and uh, to you and our panelists this evening and for sharing your valuable insights and for your personal stories panelists and alumni, we adore you. Uh, we also want to thank Abbott Diabetes Canada, uh, Diabetes Care Again, who has allowed us to, to have you here, Dr. Vallis. And um, I think if anyone has any additional questions out there in Cyberland, perhaps you just send it in and maybe we can send it to Dr. Vallis. Uh, yeah, for, happy to. Sure. Um, Thanks. It's great to have you on the panel. I, I, thank you so much, guys. It was great. I just want to thank everyone again. And next week uh, for our second webinar, we have Harley Pasternak, Master of Science, who will be talking about sleep, fitness, and nutrition. It's called Get Your Health On. And that should be a very interesting one as well. He'll be speaking again on sleep, fitness, and nutrition. Um, so uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And Alex, 
thank you because Alex is moving on. So this is the last webinar she'll be with us, uh, but she may be back. You never know <laughs> when, you, when she has nothing to do. And uh, again, thank you all for everything. Alex, do you have anything to say? <laughs> I don't, but thank you so much, Barbara. It has been a pleasure doing these webinars since day one back in, I think, April when we had started. So I guess I'm ending on lucky number 14 um, for round round two, I guess. But again, thank you to Dr. Vallis. I learned so much to, uh, this evening as well um, as someone living with also a chronic illness, not diabetes, um, but being able to get some other advice and just information has been great. I do want to make note that for the webinar next week. Just note the new time is at 2 p.m. by Dr. Vallis. Um, so the new time is at 2 p.m. next week. So just a reminder to everybody watching. Um, but again, thank you so much to everybody for joining us. And Barbara and the gang, we'll see you next week. Yeah, everyone be well and stay safe. And um, God bless you. Thank you. Bye, guys.